How's it going guys and welcome back to the channel. My name is Arthur and today we are going to go through some unexpected interview questions that are a little bit like brain teasers that I have encountered over my time interviewing. These questions largely come from some finance companies, consulting companies, hedge funds, you name it. Specifically, I'm gonna go over four brain teasers that I have picked out. The first one comes from BlackRock. Another one comes from Goldman Sachs. The third one comes from Susquehanna International Group or SIG, which is a hedge fund. And the last one comes from McKinsey, which is a consulting company. First of all, these questions are pretty fun to make a video about because they're really different. It's really hard to predict predict them. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how you want to approach these questions in an interview setting and also give you my suggested solutions. Please take these with a grain of salt. And if you have a better way of doing it, please let me know down in the comments. These questions can be kind of stressful to do, especially in an interview setting where you're feeling the pressure of the other person looking over you. These questions are here to test the way you think uh, and see how you approach a problem. So I would really say three pieces of advice when it comes to answering questions like this. Number one is clarifying that you understand the question. In a way, this can be repeating the question back to the interviewer or ask about clarification questions on the problem. And that will really help you get the ball rolling and make sure you understand the problem. Secondly, I would say don't be afraid to jot things down on a piece of paper. It's a lot easier to try and structure your thoughts in that way, um, even if there's a little bit of trial and error involved in getting your thoughts moving along. Thirdly, I would say don't be afraid to tell the interview you or what you're thinking. Even if they're just not responding to it, it's just letting them know that you're thinking about the problem and not just sitting there in silence. So our first question is from BlackRock, which is how would you find the heaviest one out of 12 balls given only three measurements with the scale? So the scale we're talking about here is, you know, one of, um, one of those scales that are sort of like this, where you can weigh them, uh, weigh two items and see which one is heavier. So this one's actually a relatively simple problem. So it's a nice one to uh, start this exercise with. So uh, let's just begin by splitting the 12 balls in two. So if we split the 12 balls in two, we get six balls each. So we'll have six and six. So that's uh, one split right here. Now for our uh, so we can weigh them, okay? So we can compare, compare these, and then let's say what we get is this six uh, is larger than that six, that's great. So we know that the heaviest ball is somewhere in here. So now we can move on to the second way. So this time let's split again. So now we're gonna have three and three. We weigh them, all right? And one of these is gonna be heavier. So let's say this time it, it's this one. So that's two. We have one more measurement left. So, and we have an odd number of balls. So what we need to do now is split it. Uh, we, need to, we need to get two balls um, of this three. So, and leave one out. So we're gonna have say two and one. Now this is the key uh, to basically solving this problem. For example, if we take this two and we weigh them and we get this ball, this one is equal to this one from these two, then we know that this one is the heaviest. However, if it turns out that this one, one of these ones is greater, then we know that in fact, one of these is the answer. So pretty simple problem. Uh, the reason it's simple is because we really just start by halving. That's like a very intuitive thing to do. Uh, and that's how we would figure out which ball is the um, heaviest only using three measurements. So you can see here we used one, two, and three. All right, so the next question here comes from Goldman Sachs, and it's, if you have a three gallon jug and a five gallon jug, how can you measure exactly four gallons of water using only these two jugs? So this is a question that you might encounter 
uh, in maybe like an investment banking interview. You could also encounter this in like a consulting interview. Let's think about how we can solve this. So we have those, these two jugs, um, jug three gallons, I'll maybe call it three GL, uh, I mean, sorry, three gallon jug, three GJ. And then we have a bigger jug. That's five. We can clearly see that if we put, if we fill, for example, the five gallon jug completely and then pour it into the, uh, into the three gallon jug, we are going to get two gallons left over here. So that's an okay start so that we need four gallons. So then what would happen if we empty that three gallon jug, we would sort of be back to square one. I guess you could pour now the rest of the five gallon jug into the three gallon jug and have one gallon left over in the three gallon jug. So this would be like up to here, it's two gallons. And then this one is completely empty again. So it looks like this, this way is probably not the optimum way that we can solve this problem. Now let's try something else. So for example, we know uh, that if we pour two jugs of the three gallon jug into the five gallon jug two times, that's gonna leave us with a three gallon jug with one gallon left over in there with one gallon left over in there. This looks like we're getting somewhere because now we have one gallon left in the three gallon jug. So that was our step one, pour two of those into the five gallon jug. So now what we can do is step two, this is one. Step two, we can empty, empty the five gallon jug. Okay. And then add the one gallon from the three gallon jug. All right, looks good. And then we can, for our final step, refill the three gallon jug and then add that to the, um, to the five gallon jug with the already existing one liter we're sorry, with the one gallon. And that will give us a total of four gallons. There we go. So this was our answer. So as you can tell, uh, we had a little bit of back and forth in the beginning, uh, which is normal. That's completely normal. Uh, I don't think an interviewer is expecting you to know straight off the bat how to solve any, a problem like that. So it's completely normal not to know the solution straight away. Sometimes you're going to have a little bit of trial and error just to get the ball rolling, just like in this situation here. So this is the SIG question. So there is a casino where you can bet on a stock going up or going down every day. The stock is 100 and it either doubles in price or goes down by 50 every single day. We have four, option, four options, bet on the stock going up, bet that it goes down, buy the stock or sell the stock. Can you find a way to guarantee profit every day, regardless of whether the stock goes up or down? Basically, let's start with our two options. The option, option one and option two, with option one being just what's happening in the situation. So option one is the stock uh, potentially going up. So that would be off the bat. I have an idea. Um, we're going to try hedge owning the stock. So if we own the stock, uh, so that would be us buying the stock and then also betting on the stock going down. So we're going to have uh, basically two contradictory movements, not perfectly contradictory though, because here we're betting on it and here we own the stock. So let me show you how this might look like. So own the stock, that would just be, let's say S, that's us owning the stock, uh, minus the bet of it going down. Uh, so let's just say this is going to be our bet going down. And then this is going to be our payout. I have that 
that as P. So now let's put some numbers to it. Uh, owning the stock would be $100 minus our bet of $50. This will be our payout of um, $50. Now, obviously this is if nothing happens, so don't worry too much about this. So option one, the stock goes up. So our stock in fact now becomes $100, sorry, $200. And our bet here is in fact $50, is in fact minus $50 because of the fact that we lost that bet, okay? So, our overall payout is, oops, is one fifty dollars in this case, which is great. It's a we have a positive payout here. Now option two, is our stock goes down fifty percent. So this actually went up one hundred percent. Just divide those two. So in this case, our stock goes down. So this becomes half of the original amount, which is 100, was 100. However, this time our bet pays off. We bet $50 and we have basically doubled that amount, which would be So we have basically gained $50 from this bet because in a bet we either lose it all or we have put up that $50 and we're gonna get $50 back. So it's, we have a double negative here. And this turns out to be our payout. So now let's quickly do the math. So we'll have $50 plus, oops. So this is also a negative by the way, negative a half. So negative $50 plus $50 from our bet that we won is going to equal our payout of zero. So we're almost there. It seems like we have almost guaranteed our profit. We can make one minor change and that's uh, making a bet above $50 in order to guarantee a positive return in option two. So all we need to do here is make our bet, let's say $51, all right, $51 here. And in that way, we're guaranteeing a payout that's larger than zero. So in this case, it will be $1, which is larger than zero. So that's great. So positive profit, this is good. Now, uh, let's just make sure we do the exact same thing up top, which will be uh, let me just, so let's erase this again. So here, let's say the bet is, whoops, let's say the bet is $51. So the payout here, uh, in this case, well, let's not worry about the payout here, actually. Just keep it as P, because that's just an illustration of what's happening. No. Um, so in here, the one below it, we'll say is $51. So then this actually changes to 49 Still positive though. There we go. So in both situations here, we have a positive payout, which is good. This, this, both positive. So to summarize this strategy, uh, basically what we wanna do is buy the underlying stock, buy the underlying stock and bet on how much, how much money we wanna bet anywhere between this part here is actually important. So we want to bet anything larger than 50 or, oh, and in fact, uh, 100. Because if we bet 100 in this situation here, we are going to uh, not make any profit because our payout is going to be, is going to cancel out our 100% increase here. So if it's going to go up 100%, and we're also betting $100. We may not move make 100, but we also lose 100, and then we get a total payout of zero. Let me 
write this a little bit better. We want our bet to be between 50 and 100. So this is number one, the guaranteed profit every day. All right, not too bad. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope that was insightful. If you found it helpful, please consider dropping a like and subscribing. Out of those three problems, I would say the SIG problem was probably the hardest. So let me know if I made an error or if you guys believe there is a better and faster way to do this. Nevertheless, hope this was helpful uh, and a fun little video to break things up. Once again, thank you all so much for watching. I really appreciate all the support and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.